the, the, way, the way this particular uh, forum developed or ev evolved over the years is we started getting so many directors coming from different parts of the world. Uh, and we said every year that we needed to come together uh, to just sit and discuss some of the issues that we all face. I don't think any festival uh, does not face difficulties. Every festival has challenges, but they also have learnings. Some of it are local, some of it come from experience, and I thought this would be a platform for us to share this. As many of you know today, there are a number of forums that we all get to meet, both for literature festivals as well as for international festivals. And Ed, we started it in Edinburgh some years ago uh, with a consortium, and then there was a thing that that consortium became very exclusive, and then there was a larger consortium of festival directors who won part of that festival. And we've been sort of arguing for a while that there shouldn't be necessarily uh, an entry point or an entry barrier to festival directors, but we should all share our experiences and help each other. Uh, more importantly, we certainly at Jaipur and at, the, at Teamwork Arts are very happy to collaborate, and we've done that with many festivals around this table. Uh, provide know-how which is requi when required, uh, provide support, share writers' names, share artists' names, uh, create a, back, uh, a, a black book of those people who should never be invited again, and my black book is increasing <laughs> yearly. Um, but really, come together to work together because we know that resources are limited, and resources in the world of the arts is never infinite. And we're all struggling uh, with small pieces of, or small amounts of money and resources. But if we pool it together, for example, here at the Jaipur Literature Festival, because a number of festivals work their dates around us, we're able to share costs of airfares at a very simple level. But there's much more uh, that can be done. So this really is that forum. What I would love each of you to do, and we are, how many of us are, are we? One, two, three, four, five, 12, uh, and two missing, so 14. So if each of us do sort of a, a couple of minutes each, sort of three minutes each, um, does that add up? Yeah, we'll be able to get some time then to have discussions. So about three minutes if each of you tell us a little bit about your festival and one main challenge that you may have and some advice in terms of how you feel by collaborating, we can work together in the future. So I'm gonna start uh, by asking Anya uh, uh, to start. Anya is with a, a Makondo Literary Festival and I, I, in Nairobi, and I immediately asked her, I said, you know, here in Jaipur, we're very underrepresented, if at all, uh, from, uh, from writers from Africa. We tend to have a couple every now and then, but we don't have anywhere uh, near enough of, for what we should have. And therefore, we don't have any understanding of what's been happening in that part of the world and stories from there. So I've asked Anya that in the future to please recommend writers who could come here. But Anya, tell us a little bit about Makondo and some of the uh, issues that you face. Thank you. Um, and I'm absolutely happy to share those recommendations. Uh, the Makondo Literary Festival was, uh, took place first in 2019. Uh, this year we will have our fourth edition. It is a literary festival that uh, has two goals. Um, the first one is to um, extend the horizon of our readership. Uh, that reads in English, as Kenya's uh, language of instruction and reading is English, uh, the, to extend the horizon what African literature is, that it is more than just literature written in English, but also those written in other colonial African languages, but also local languages. So we have continuously extended our reach of the continent. The first festival had writers, African writers who write in English and Portuguese. The next one was added with uh, writers uh, who write in French. Then last year, Arabic. And this year, we want to extend our geographical reach to the um, world of the Indian Ocean because our festival is also a festival of African histories told by African authors from an African perspective. So we all know Africa's, India's uh, histories are written by 
the colonial powers mainly by from a victor's perspective and many aspects of the histories were left out and um, African writers in the last maybe 10 or so years have increasingly picked up um, historical events on the continent and fictionalized it and included uh, the perspectives of women, of uh, farmers, of people who were not, uh, who are not in the um, official colonial histories in the archives. Uh, yeah, this is what we want to do with our festival. And uh, Alanya, is there an issue with um, a censorship or control of, of any kind of writing in Kenya or it's fairly free? How do you see? There is no censorship at the moment. Uh, we have a new president. Uh, Good, bad, ugly? The second. Um, but uh, uh, don't worry, this doesn't go. This is not online, right? Um, the problem is more that uh, he doesn't have the wisest economic policies, which also affects us in a way, because there is less disposable income for people to buy books of the authors that we invite, or sponsorship, of course, because I'm sure funding is everyone's main concern here. And that will not help in the long run. But um, we are really encouraged um, by the response of our audience. And when we started, there was no literary festival in Kenya, let alone the East Africa region. And we have really invited all the big names in African literature in the last three festivals. And I have to say, we really are the only festival of that caliber in the region. And I'm happy and proud to say so. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Claudia is from the Frankfurt Book Fair. It's a book fair, but it also has a literary program which happens in a beautiful venue in the middle of the many pavilions. Uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair, and we've been collaborating for a number of years. It's the most exciting place to go to do book deals and also just see and discover new work. Claudia, tell us a little bit, and also the challenges post-COVID, because there have been some challenges. So how do you see that going into the future? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, but first of all, let me congratulate you, Sanjoy, Namita, for this wonderful festival. And I must say, I am completely amazed about the number of people who are coming to the events. That is so gorgeous. I mean, really wonderful. Um, so I am um, I'm always the smallest person in the room. But I am representing perhaps the oldest uh, event here. We just celebrated 70. And the largest. <laughs> yeah, and the largest. But also 75 years of Frankfurt Book Fair. And as you probably all know, thank you. As you probably all know, it's the biggest um, book fair. But when I say book fair, it's not really a book fair as many people in this room or all over the world know book fairs. It's not a selling event. It's a three-day professional event, so it's the biggest meeting point for publishers and creatives from all over the world. Um, before COVID, we had about 7,000 exhibitors from um, 100 countries, 110 countries sometimes, so sort of like the United Nations of Publishing. We are also very concerned about small and independent publishers, so we always have the best prices, the cheapest options for small publishers. So um, it's not just about the book fair. But um, apart from the professional event, we also, as Sanjay just mentioned, have a big literary festival with lots of readings, about 4,000 events altogether, maybe 2,000 literary events. Um, and apart from that, it's also worth mentioning that we, um, we are all about exchange and we work internationally, so we had offices in Moscow and New Delhi and New York and China and nowadays also in Southeast Asia. Um, and you asked me about the challenges of uh, Corona. Mm. We had to close, let's say, for instance, our office in New Delhi, which um, is, a, is very sad and I hope we can reopen it, seeing what's happening and how dynamic the industry is here. But that was one of the reasons. So we had to, and I also need to say that we belong to the Publishers and Booksellers Association of Germany. Um, and so when the book fair could not happen for one year in 2020, we had to get, uh, had let go of a lot of staff, about 40%. 
We had to close some of our offices, cut, uh, cut down costs wherever we could. And we only coming back slowly. So in 21, we had about 30% of our regular exhibitor number, and then uh, we went to 50%, and I hope that this year we are back to 80%. So that's, well, that was one of the main challenges, and of course, in, these day, or in this time, where everybody got used to Zoom calls and Zoom conferences, people say, hmm, why should we spend all that money? Flights, hotels, space, food. So that's something we also But Claudia, isn't it true, equally true, and we are seeing it here, and certainly in all the festivals that we do, that yes, it was easy uh, to connect while, you were, uh, while there was COVID, but everybody very quickly got tired of doing anything on Zoom, especially transacting business. And while, for example, during COVID, the Jaipur Richa festivals, uh, uh, the, when we went online in 2021, there were 25 million people who watched an episode or the other, but I think we sold less than 1,000 books online. Whereas here, with you know, 100th the amount of people coming through the doors, they will probably land up selling about 95,000 books in five days. You know, so there is that difference. Absolutely, completely agreed. And what uh, the publishers told me, and you all will know better, um, that if you already have a connection and you need to buy the rights, because that's what Frankfurt is mostly about when we talk about professionals, you need to do it. And you need to find a way of doing it. And Zoom is a very convenient way of doing it. However, if you want to have new contacts, that's the issue. And that's the, the real challenge. So yes, people were, and um, I, I can't remember who said that, that last year when, uh, yeah, 23, when many, many people came back, someone said, I felt that everyone was much more attentive and much, you know, you could see the happiness of people being able to connect to each other and not just over Zoom. So yes, it, it, that definitely helps. Well, thank you for bringing the delegation that you brought oh, yeah. from Germany, exactly. Claudia, and we hope that this is going to be yeah. uh, an annual feature as well. And going back to Attentive, I don't know about you all, I just find that the audiences this year, for example, have been hugely attentive, taking from every session something much more than earlier, and I don't know quite what the reason is. Let me ask, Namita normally opens the uh, director's roundtable with her comments, so let me ask her uh, now to open it. Thank you for coming. I know you were at a session. I'm, I'm sorry, I was late. And you've got your voice back. Yay! I ha you think so? Mostly. Well, we won't talk about what went wrong, why I got late. But, can you hear me? So the thing is that the Jaipur bookmark, thanks to the support of all of you, this year, I think we've reached critical mass in the sense that we've, thanks to Manisha's programming, someone's, everybody's input, it, what it's meant to be. And what I'd really like to talk about while welcoming all of you who are part of the book trade, and I'd say that festival directors are a part of the book trade, the business of books, the business of ideas, the business of uh, facilitating authors. Um, we have to learn from each other because each of us faces a particular set of challenge. And it just struck me, we can talk about it later perhaps, but at least annually, we should have a place uh, <clears throat> which could be virtual and sometimes physical, where um, each of us who's involved with a festival talks about it, puts it on a calendar, uh, both the future years and what went by. So report on the past year, who are the main people involved, what are the emails of the people if they want, other festival directors want to suggest speakers and writers and things like that. I think it would be, I mean, I don't know who would volunteer to take on the hard work, but it's not that hard and I'm willing to put in my bit of effort to <clears throat> make it happen. I think we need, this annual meeting could lead to greater coordination between festivals. Uh, <clears throat> there are people who may want to send people to Colorado to, well, Frankfurt is different, it's much more organized but many younger festivals could benefit hugely. And I welcome some of the people here today who are really making new efforts. If I could in introduce 
but he will speak to him later, Hem Panth, who <clears throat> is from my part of the woods in the Himalayas. And he set up very credible festivals in small villages. So everybody's working with different challenges from the big to the small. And I'm happy if anybody later can pick up this idea of just having one website maybe within the Lit Fest where we could coordinate this. You were saying something. So this is actually now being done by, in cons as a consortium, which was being led by the Emirates Literature Festival and all our colleagues in Frankfurt and the other, uh, in, in Germany and the other festivals. So that's already. But those were big festivals. No, no, now it's for everybody. I mean, the idea I was, I was saying earlier today is rather than having these consortiums which are morally exclusive, this idea is to have it much more inclusive. Yes. So that's already being done, and there'll be a whole website with the information, etc. Well, then, they, I mean, I jumped the gun, but I'm so glad it's being done. If we could inform some of the smaller festivals here. And thank you all for being here. I won't take up time. I'll talk towards the end when I process all that has been said. Should we go back this Yeah, I'm now? going to go back to uh, Deba Salim. De uh, Deba Salim Irfan is from uh, Dubai, and she curates the uh, Festival on Poetry and Art. And that's so interesting because just in this last session that I was moderating, uh, with, uh, with Abhishek Singh, he talked about the relationship between poetry and art, and all of his published books, though he's an artist, is about poetry and art. And, and once again, Deba, I know that this, is a, this may be difficult for you to answer, but love you to also focus on in places like Dubai, as in Singapore, and some of the other Middle East and shakedowns, how do you deal with the issue of what can be said and what can't? How do you deal with the issue of gender? How do you deal with the issue of identity, especially when it comes to sexual identity? Yeah, I think that's really important. First of all, uh, thanks for having me here, and congratulations on a beautiful event that you've put together, especially the challenges that were there yesterday. And uh, yeah, I would lovely event last evening, beautiful. Um, so to talk about the event that uh, we organize in Dubai, which is the Habib. Now, Emirates Lit Fest is huge. It's like you rightly said, it's huge. And there is a lot of space where we can do smaller and much more uh, focused uh, festivals. So uh, the Habib is a global art and poetry festival where we have joined together five languages, Arabic, English, Hindi, Malayalam, and Urdu. So the challenge there is uh, pretty much about what you can say and can't say because the censorship is quite huge. And um, especially in the current scenario of polarization, like you were talking about the Palestine and Israel conflict. And there are a lot of families in Dubai who have moved in from uh, you know, Palestine and they're living there, or they have families back home. Now, we can't say a couple of things on stage there. Therefore, um, in the festival, in the English round, when we had people with mixed backgrounds, there had to be certain uh, you know, guidelines that we had to provide to each one of them. Some of them are not aware what even briefly cannot be even pointed out or spoken about. Can you give us a sense of what these are? What's the sort of no-go zone? Um, I, I think broadly, what we can't talk about is anything political, anything religious, anything that can, uh, you know, create friction in whatever ways. So, uh, so I was really happy to, you know, see how people navigated. So we had our co-moderator who was from Pakistan, and she was deeply moved by what was happening in Palestine. And she was like, can I just say one line? Can I just say something? I said, no, I'm sorry, but we cannot say anything. So while moderating, you have like an Arab uh, poet, we have a Filipino on stage, and we had one uh, Arabic poet, and yeah, so those three, four different uh, nationalities. And uh, she was quite into saying something about Palestine. So finally, we agreed on saying, uh, you know, she read out a beautiful poem from uh, Muhammad Darwish, who's a national poet of Palestine. So that's how she could vent out what she had in her mind and still you know, not say anything conflicting in some ways. So yeah, those are challenges which we face in Dubai, but I think everybody sitting there in audience and on stage, 90%, they know what, uh, you know, what are the challenges, what they can and cannot. However, we have authors or poets who are coming in from other countries, like Urdu, we had everybody coming from India, so we had to give them a full page of 
what are the limitations. And when we're talking about the uh, interaction between art and poet, poetry, the final session we had was beautiful because we had live painting on stage with music, with dance. So it was a wonderful thing. Can you just give us a size of the festival and how many uh, days and how many speakers? We, we just started last year. Uh, so the speakers were about 60 people coming from around, uh, you know, from, from Germany, from India, from London, from local, from UAE. The um, audience was also limited, it's about 7,000 people who visited over the period of two days, two to three days. Yeah. And where was it? Where was it? It located? was at India Club. So um, we have different venues within the club. Uh, so we had it there. Yeah. And rough budget idea of uh, rough budget. Where do you get your resources from? Uh, well, we were just discussing about the funding. Uh, that is a huge, um, you know, block that we have. But we could find a couple of uh, sponsors this time because in Urdu, like you know, that the heavyweight from India, we like to invite them to Dubai. And people like to sponsor on his name. So although, well, things are there and, you know, we need to figure out a way where we, f we reach out to people who love literature and give funds on the basis of literature alone. But, yeah, sadly, we are still to reach that stage. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, from 7,000, I'm going to go to 700,000, which is uh, Govind DC and Ravi DC's festival at the Kerala Literature Festival. Um, they're also the commissioning editor for DC Books, which is one of the largest publishing houses in Kerala. And they do a lot of translation publishing as well. I think they have, they used to have 50 stores. I don't know whether it's 150 uh, stores right now. But go and tell us in a very short period of time, uh, your festival has really captured the imagination down there. It's based on the beach. You have a lot of local support today. Uh, tell us some of the challenges. Uh, quickly, Sanjoy. We will reach 700,000 soon, but we're half a million strong. Uh, so uh, the Kerala Literature Festival started in 2016. Uh, we are, as Sanjoy mentioned, literally on the beach. Um, uh, for those that love to hear a little bit of history, this is literally the same strip of the coastline where the Portuguese first, first set foot in India. So it's historic in that sense, but it's a small town. It's a coastal town. Uh, it's this town with one of the smallest airports in the state, and that throws a lot of challenges at us. Uh, but quickly, we are a bilingual lit fest. About 60% of our programming is Malayalam. Uh, we managed around 318 sessions in across four days. There were seven venues all across the beach. Um, I mean, we started with basically three in 2016, and across the years, we've had to expand into this. The biggest challenge we face, and probably why we ended up doing 318 sessions, is being a publisher means that uh, your authors have a certain expectation that they'd be called every year. And the pressure sometimes overwhelms us. Next year, I think we'll be a little more better at telling them no, or at least figuring out more intelligent ways to accommodate people. But um, Do a second festival. <laughs> we'll, we're, still, we're still trying to crack the whole funding game, because uh, a, a good portion of it is funded ourselves. Um, this year, I think, has been the year with the most amount of uh, funding that uh, we've raised. And yet, we've, uh, I think we'll be spending close to 80 lakhs from our own pockets. Uh, I meant to lots of words here. Um, it was about 500 and, uh, 520 speakers that we've managed uh, this year. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. It's my fourth night of not having much sleep, so my brain is actually blanking. <laughs> Tell us some of the challenges, Govind, of becoming so big so quickly. Um, A, programming, because uh, at this scale, you really need to start thinking of uh, interests of a lot of your audiences. Um, of course, you, can, you, you have so many books. That, there are so many books that we would want to feature. But then over the years, we found that, you know, because it's Malayalam heavy, and we've in some sense exhausted every single Malayalam author that there is, coming out with interesting permutations, being contemporary while, you know, not asking the same author to talk literature alone can be a challenge. Um, so that's one aspect of programming that we face. In terms of logistics, um, as I said, it's a small town. So the amount of hotels that we need to coordinate, I think this year we've We've had to work with nine hotels. 
and you know, uh, this, this throws a huge wrench into logistics. Uh, as I said, it's a town with a very small airport, so there's literally one flight going out of Calicut to Delhi directly, there's one coming in, there's two uh, to Mumbai every day, so what this means is uh, the window of time someone stays uh, can be a little longer, and even if they want to go back, we ha they'll have to wait another 24 hours if their sessions are post uh, 2 p.m. And so uh, it, it, it adds to the cost, it adds to uh, their time being there. And we, uh, when you have so many speakers, uh, even trying to squeeze a third session out of somebody means that we'll have to find a slot or something a little relevant. And that has been one of the biggest challenges this year. But we've tried our hand at being a little unconventional. Um, we've handpicked a few of our authors who we know are a little more cooperative and told them, instead of saying, show us something, so some of the, uh, one of the best fiction titles that we've just come out involves the story of uh, a, a 16th century story of a guy who decided to join with the Catholic Church and the Pope and decided to give two elephants to the Pope himself. And he had a very interesting, and this is a real thing, it's, it, it happened. And so there was a, a, a huge number of uh, archives that he worked out of. And we told him, instead of talking about it, show us what you worked with. And he did this elaborate presentation and it really got people thinking about how connected we were at the time. So we, I mean, we did the same with Benjamin, who's one of our biggest authors. In fact, at the fest, uh, his most selling novel called Goat Days, we published the 168th edition of it, which was originally published in 2008. It was a single copy edition, the 168th edition, because it was also the 300,000th copy of it. But incidentally, this is also the same year where his book is actually coming out as a film. It's coming out in April. So we had the director and him talk about the adaptation. But instead of talking a lot, we said, can you show us some exclusive footages of working behind the scenes and all that stuff? So immersion a little more than just being on the text was something that we worked with. Uh, Pirmal Murugan had uh, an adaptation of Vadi Vassal that Kannan is representing, and it was becoming... A, it and was receiving the award for. Uh, that was Firebird. This is another That's novel. Um, so... We wanted uh, Perumal Murugan and the, and the illustrator to actually do a presentation of what the novel is with the, with the entire graphic novel being represented on a giant screen. We did film screenings each night. We had a 65-foot screen on the beach every night. We would play films on it. Um, so, yeah, a little more immersion, something that uh, we can do that's a little more than just two people or four people on a stage talking a any political challenges? You're in a fairly liberal state with some it, illiberal it, views. Well, it, it is challenging still, and we we get we get we get pressures here and there. Sometimes it is to invite certain people, and we tell them sometimes we can, but we can't control the audience, and the author should be ready for it. Um, but yes, uh, you know visas are becoming tough. I can't mention authors' names here, but last year when we tried bringing someone they did not give him the visa. And it's still there. It's the That's same true of every festival across the world yeah. from here and why and Edinburgh and us. And, and, and we, have that, we have that issue. Um, I, I like to think we are in a liberal space, but we do feel the pressure. Um, and sometimes, I mean, we've ha we felt a lot of pressure in 2018 when we had a uh, very set of political uh, uh, sessions. But uh, the people that joined that year have been ardent supporters since. Um, Arindadi Roy uh, actually showed up in 2018. That was the year we had a lot of pressure on. But she came back again in 2019 simply because of what happened in 2018. And now she's been supporting us externally with a lot of guests. Um, and she's asking us to be even more edgy at times. But yeah, pressures are there. Pressures are there. It's just that the state government does support us in some sense. Um, whether it's with the venue or whether it's with getting certain clearances. We can go to them and they'll say, let us sort, it out. Let, let us sort this out for you. So. Thank you, thank you. Hannah Curtis, as many of you know, run the uh, wonderful Ubud Festival. And just, I think yesterday we were having a conversation in terms of should Ubud grow uh, exponentially like so many other festivals? And I said, why, does, why do niche festivals so, that are so beautifully located, especially this one which uses a cafe uh, called Luna, or, uh, Luna, uh, the Luna Cafe, which I fell in love with when I went many, many years ago, and it'll feature in a, in, a, in a book that I'm doing about ghost stories. Um, why do you need to grow? And Hannah, tell us a little bit about uh, the, uh, the festival, of course, and why is it that people love 
to want to go uh, to Ubud and to the festival. Actually, I'm Janet. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Hannah, Janet. <laughs> Hannah's not well today, so um, Hannah works for the festival. Um, I'm the founder and director. Uh, thank you anyway for having us here. Uh, it's very exciting to be back because I used to come in the early days and we haven't been back for a while. I can't remember what our last year was, but um, it's just... You haven't just been back for about seven or eight years. Yeah, but yes. And yeah, and uh, it's very exciting to see how you've grown and um, the kind of audiences. I think we're all uh, deeply envious that you can attract so many people. Um, it comes with its own challenges, I you promise you. Of course, if true, true. So, uh, uh, our festival started in 2004. Uh, we were created after the first Bali bombing, so I like to think we're a festival with a cause. Uh, and it was, yeah, the bombings and the sort of terrorist activity that um, I guess our mantra was, the pen is mightier than the sword. And we felt literature was the most powerful weapon that we have to challenge uh, any kind of a dilemma as such. And so uh, yeah, we've grown since then. We're still um, an intimate festival. Uh, I guess our audiences or attendances are around 25,000 and it runs for kind of five days in Ubud in October, which uh, was to commemorate the Bali bombings, but it's also the month of literature in Indonesia. Um, we have many different challenges. Um, there's the physical challenges. I don't know if anybody, uh, any other festival has had as many as we have. Uh, volcanoes erupting, earthquakes. Um, what else have we had? Uh, terrorism anyway. Um, we've had the censorship challenge when we were threatened uh, not to be given a permit to run the festival in 2015 because we were commemorating the communist coup in Indonesia, which was then 50 years old. Um, yeah, so we've had lots of physical challenges and also we're in a country that where Indonesians don't actually read a lot. Um, so then to approach sponsors to have a writer's festival when people don't necessarily, yeah, um, yeah read a lot or value reading that much. So that's kind of a big challenge for us and of course we have many languages as well. Um, so our, yeah, we're constantly trying to be creative in how to bring in more Indonesians um, and also to attract more young Indonesians because uh, with a population of around 27, 270 million, which is less than yours, I think half the population is under 35. So uh, we're always trying to think how to bring the young folk in as our next generation of, of attendees. Um, so yeah, we have fun with the program because we're in a, a cute tourist destination. So I understood when you were talking about your programming, doing cute things. Um, you know, we, we take people walking up the hillside to do bird watching in the morning. Um, we have all sorts of workshops that include walking tours of Ubud, which you probably do as well. Um, seeing in, in people creating food in the back streets or um, different sessions like that. We try and be as creative as possible and also to focus on the arts. So ultimately we are trying to showcase Indonesian literature to create opportunities for Indonesian writers and also for the young emerging writers. Um, we, we bring them in from all over. We also have an emerging writers program and then we have what we call the satellite program. So after the festival, um, we understand that a lot of Indonesians can't come to us, so we go to them. So we visit about six remote cities. Um, could be in eastern Indonesia, you know, um, Flores or uh, Papua, um, or then across to Sumatra, Lampung, um, other parts of uh, Java, etc., so that we can connect with the literary audiences there and the writers. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working over time to help grow our audience, to create a stronger program, to create more writing opportunities or publishing opportunities. Uh, and ultimately, I'd love to see more Indonesians you know, in festivals like this or even getting their work translated into English is a, a big step for them. So, so Janet, are you all seen to be a sort of foreign festival? Are you seen to be a Balinese festival? Are you seen to be an Indonesian? And I make these distinctions yes. because Bali is obviously a very specific 
island in the larger Indonesian archipelago. Uh, archipelago. Yeah. I guess we initially were seen as a foreign festival because our audience was mainly foreign and honestly mainly Australian women of a certain age. Um, my age, I guess, and older. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we want to be seen as an Indonesian festival. Um, I guess Indonesian festival in Bali. So uh, the, the Balinese are actually quite shy to come to our festival. So we have to go to you know, Denpasar to create special events where they feel at home. Um, I think they get in, a bit intimidated by um, so many tourists in one place. Um, and, you know, we were talking before, Claudia, you know, how maybe for the Balinese we just need more food and um, more shopping, you know, things like that that excite them. So, um, yeah, um, Mary Jane and, and Mark uh, are big supporters of the festival here as well. Uh, that's my daughter and my husband, by the way. Um, so anyway, yeah, we have different challenges. And tell us a little bit, you know, in, in the larger program that you do, um, how does that sort of lead to more enthusiasm or interest in, in writing? And how does that lead to then it, those works being published and translated? Is there a program for that? Well, the, um, well, the Emerging Writers Program is one of those initiatives where we um, put out, uh, you know, offers to submit their work, um, writers under 35. So if they want to send in their work, uh, we will yeah, select them and translate it and then publish it in an anthology. And also we bring them to the festival. So we select about 15 young Indonesians and we fly them to Ubud. A lot of them have never been on a plane before, let alone le left their town before. Uh, we've had stories of some of them back in the day when they had to post their um, submission, having to wait till the crocodiles would pass the river before they could go to the post office and things like that. So, um, yeah, the idea is just to try and create opportunities for them that might pave the way for a career in writing and that will then help them be ultimately published in English. And so we've had some success stories and uh, we like to keep in touch with everybody. We have sort of an uh, alumni of young writers and uh, yeah, we're just uh, doing as much as we can to help foster a whole new generation of writers. And unlike perhaps in, in mainland uh, Java, Sumatra, etc., uh, you do do work which is LGBTQ uh, and identity, etc., which perhaps you wouldn't be able to do if you were in any of the other major cities. In Bali, yes, we do a lot with that. Bali is still uh, a fairly neutral platform, uh, so we pretty well can talk about any of those issues in, in Java. It would be a, a different story. Uh, and we also learned how to play the game. Uh, you know, with the threat in 2015 of nearly being closed down, we sort of realized uh, we can discuss anything. It's just how we word it in the program. So we just have to be creative so we can still discuss uh, issues. But yeah, we just have to be clever how we write that so that the authorities that, that we show the program to um, don't feel yeah, threatened. Uh, Hempanji is from uh, Uttarakhand, Haldwani. Festival uh, 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 so that it went from village to village. It's not necessarily just in one place. Portugal COVID just in North Portugal. And uh, there was a big fire uh, up in north. My Hindi is not that bad, just for the record. <laughs> so up north uh, in Portugal, you know, there was this huge fire that ravaged a whole number of towns. And 187 people died uh, in 2017-18. And when they called, they said, you know, how can we, what can we do to commemorate this 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 occasion, we wanted to do something that's not just about just not funereal, but it's really to commemorate. And one of the things that we suggested is you know do a festival which travels to each of these villages and towns. Uh, we have a we have a program which we used to call Words on Fire, uh, Words on Water, 
and in this case it was called words on on fire and it went from village to village it's quite an extraordinary festival of food of music and of course of of local literature to aap zara bataiye yeah so tell us a little bit about uh, thanks uh, thanks uh, uh thanks to giving uh, time to us i am from uttarakhand uh, india this is as uh, namita ma'am has uh, mentioned uh, we have just started our uh, kitab kautik kitab is uh, all of you know book kautik is uh, basically fair in our local language so it is a kind of uh, book fair with a local theme in uttarakhand we all know that uh, uttarakhand or himalaya are the source of our literature in since the ancient time uh, so we started with the theme of starting uh, book fairs to the room, remotest areas of himalaya and uh, uh, we have two ma- uh, basic ideas Just, uh, we wanted to take thousands of books uh, fr- around the world or around india to the remotest part of himalaya or uttarakhand uh, touching Uh, new uh, students younger generation and uh, general public and second idea was to highlight the to historical places of uttarakhand which are not in main map of tourism so we started it from tanakpur tanakpur is a small vill- uh, village kind of town which is situated in the border of nepal and india it is uh, around uh, 300 kilometers from delhi so we just started uh, uh it as an basic idea of uh, collecting thousand of books in the remote uh, remotest area and uh, it was just clicked uh, because people take it uh, very fast and it was thousands so we uh, we conducted it for two days and uh, we were very glad to know that uh, around 10000 people from the around 3 4 districts of kumau region of uttarakhand gathered there and uh, within one year uh, we completed seven uh, kitab kautiks in uttarakhand so we have just concluded seventh in nanak matta which is a very holy place of sikhism in uttarakhand uh, nanak sahab has uh, himself visited visited there Uh, so it was we have covered uh, there are two regions in uttarakhand uh, garhwal and kumau we have covered all districts of kumau within one year and we have just we are just going to start our eighth event uh, from 9th 9th 10th and 11th in haldwani which is uh, uh, 200 300 kilometers from uh, uh, delhi uh, haldwani is a good town good city of uttarakhand but uh, before that we have conducted all the uh, festivals in uh, we can i can name them tanakpur uh, then baisnath is a uh, very uh, historical town of it is capital of it was capital of kathuri uh, kingdom then we went to champavat uh, we we can see very ancient uh, temples there in champavat uh, it was uh, capital of chand chand dynasty then we went to pithoragarh which is uh, border district of china and nepal pithoragarh then uh, dwarahat dwarahat is also a very uh, uh, old city dwarahat then bhimtal bhimtal you all know it is a very well known tourist place then we did it at uh, nanangmatta and now we are going to uh, conduct it in, in haldwani so himmat how many Eastern. how many authors do you take to each of these places and where do you set up when you go to what, is it a school is it a public yeah. area uh, and where do you get the books yeah. i will i will i will try to answer both the ans- uh, both these questions uh, because uh, transportation is a very very big challenge for us uh, there is there are no airports there is only one operational teri- uh, airport in uttarakhand uh, it is capital city of 
Dehradun. Uh, uh, so we we rely on local transports. So it is a challenge for us to call big writers to these remotest places. But we we have uh, managed to invite and uh, uh, attended by Pushpesh Pant, Devan Mewadi, Sekhar Patak, who know them uh, <laughs> very well, and they they have connected. They have their roots in the that uh, in those areas. So uh, we we focus on uh, exposing our remotest areas to the books. Thousand of book, uh, uh, we have ne never done the events less than fifty thousands, and we are targeting seventy thousand books in Haldwani, and we'll cross it. So the question from Namita Ma'am is. Uh, we have some groups in Uttarakhand who are doing very well. They have a rich collection of books and uh, they do kind of business in books only. And they are students. We have a, uh, I can name them, we have a uh, group of students in Pithoragad. Uh, they uh, organize the events in remotest areas, small uh, fairs kind of thing in schools and uh, local fairs they they buy the yeah, yeah people buy the book in terms of uh, we were you were uh, mentioning the amount so i can proudly say that in pithoragad uh, they they sell sold kind of 1 million rupees of books in 2 days and and it is uh, it is on it was raining on both the days <laughs> it was raining on both the days in june July. Yeah, yeah. in a, some part of some part, some part of the city, some part of the Uttarakhand, they are, they are very uh, literature lovers. They are there, so it is a successful program. And as I as I mentioned, we face challenges in traveling kind of thing. Some. Uh, Where does the money come from? <laughs> this is the biggest challenge. Uh, uh, we started uh, with crowdfunding and uh, two or three events we managed to get support from uh, government also district administration they uh, liked the idea they called us and uh, uh, they discussed and uh, uh, district administ administrators they they were agree to uh, fund the programs but uh, it was not suitable for us. We, we did it twice, and in third case, we, we were trapped. Our uh, uh, complaint was that these people don't know what they are doing, what is in their mind, and there were some uh, photos of some of the books reached to the top level in Dehradun that they are not uh, supporting our ideology. So they, there should be no support to them. So by uh, for last four uh, events, we are organizing it through crowdfunding. And we try to keep the budget very low. Very low means kind of uh, half million rupees. Panch lakh is what we try to collect, but we never reach that <laughs> place. <laughs> So, but, but the output of that event is, uh, Nanang Matta is a very small town. Uh, it, is, it, it is population of around 15,000. And I can proudly say that uh, within three days, we could get the footfall of more than 12,000 persons. We covered whole of this uh, district, uh, uh, around 100 kilometers span we first day we managed uh, managed to send our guests to the school for career counseling writers uh, adventure sports persons writers or theater artists they they uh, uh, shared their experience with the kids of the school uh, because it is a new thing for uh, students of those remote areas to know how uh, uh, I can mention Rina Dharmasaktu, who is first lady to reach South Pole. She is from Uttarakhand. 
see, uh, see talk to thousands of girls in those remote areas and told uh, the girls that how she achieved that path. So it was very, uh, very, so, very... So just to translate, uh, uh, he does his festival in about $4,000. That's the, that's the amount. So I think we need to all give him a, a big round of applause for that and learn from that in terms of how is that done. But I don't know whether you've been in touch with uh, Pratham Books also because they do our outreach program. We reach out to about 110 schools. So uh, maybe there's a possibility there because they've been doing a lot of work in your area as well. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, 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 I'm here to learn how we could uh, make it easy for us to organize these programs. And uh, b because uh, there is a plenty of opportunities in Uttarakhand to do it. People like to read, to read the books, but we need to read them because it is a very challenging to transport Get them, anything traveling there. them. Yes, landscape. Yes, is yes. Very Geographically, it is very challenging. Thank you, Hempanth. Uh, Jesse Friedman, uh, 11 years ago, sent us an email saying why, why we needed to go to Boulder, Colorado to set up JLF there. Uh, she's been heading up our organization there for the last 11 years. She's just 10 years, 11 years. She's just stepped down as uh, the uh, festival head in JLF, Boulder, Colorado, but of course continues to be on our board there. Jesse. And, and when we arrived, I remember asking the mayor of, uh, of Boulder, uh, Jesse had set up a whole host of meetings. <coughs> I said, you know, mayor, <coughs> in a very white town, which Boulder was, where every time we arrived, we were, I think, the only people of color, why is it that you want a festival uh, from so far away? Uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Well, as uh, white as Boulder is and as somewhat elite, left, conscious as Boulder is, we do crave diversity. We really do. Um, but that's hard for us to access for I infinite number of reasons because we are white and elite and leftist and all that. However, um, I, I wonder if you're still wondering why bring the festival to Boulder. <laughs> no, tell us but a little bit about how it grew and the challenges thereof. Yeah, the challenges continually are kind of paradoxical and confounding. Uh, funding, whereas Boulder is one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. Um, uh, these days in the States, I'm not sure how it is around the world, Authors, rightfully so, would like an honorarium. And while we cover all travel costs, accommodations, f uh, food, generally speaking, there's been no honorariums, but that's not flying anymore as acceptable. Um, and I, I think the challenge in, well, around the world I'm hearing is the younger generations, except for here in Jaipur, uh, but m even moreover in Boulder, it's the absolute quintessential un um, United States audience that could fathom the profundity of what a literature festival is, not just JLF, but what you all do and why you all do it and what you know is at the core and heart of what you're doing. It's not just, oh, I like to read. It's that anything important in the world is happening through words and meaning is happening through words. And um, when Namita talked about a consortium of international, I mean, all my lights went off, though perhaps it already exists. Uh, there is a United States listserv for about 500 United States literature festivals, but the idea of connecting the world that way almost feels like activism. <laughs> you know, and I think that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think conveying that this is kind of the epitome of what a Boulderite would relish. And, it's hard, and yet it's hard to get that message through. Yet if anybody drops by the library, even a young person drops by the library, suddenly they're just stunned, thrown against the wall with, almost shocked at what is happening here. So, you know, getting that message to people, I'd love to, you know, brainstorm that. I also am looking now at, you know, I'm always craving um, 
African writers. Teamwork Arts has Shiny a good, gum. has a good handle on um, Asian authors, but even European, and working with maybe government cultural councils. But it's been hard for me to find what that actual inroad is. So connecting with any of you, if you'd like to send writers to the United States, it's so necessary. And, and, and we're authors that come to JLF Boulder, and this is not my doing, this is Namita William and Sanjoy's doing, but authors who come to Boulder and who've been to countless literature festivals say they've never been at anything like this, ever, even in Boulder, Colorado, because of the flavor that JLF is able to produce, and probably many of you as well. Part of that is that it is an inter it's not a United States flavor. It's an international flavor. Immediately, I think once the tagline Namita had was, or bringing the world to Boulder, and that is different in the United States. Literature festivals are wonderful throughout the states, but this is something uh, unique. Getting that message across has been a challenge, yeah. And of course, there we work with the Boulder Public Library. Yes. And the Boulder Public Library, they're off also one, the best library yeah. of, of, of the state or United States the state, or yeah, of yeah, the state. Yeah. And we have a Boulder Day, I mean, a JLF Day in Colorado. Working with, in this case, mm -hmm. government, is that a challenge? It is. Um, part of that is because, you know, the city council is, is a constant merry-go-round of different people and new people. The Arts Commission, a constant merry-go-round, who oh, you spend so much work making these relationships, and two years later, it's brand new people who have no idea who you are. Um, uh, there's also, there's a kind of arrogance amongst people in Boulder, and uh, that they know better, and especially if they're in the government. So... Um, convincing them that you actually know something and are offering something unique and different. Again, it's the messaging, it's the communication. People are mm, surprised, possessive of power. <laughs> and, yeah. There are two questions. My switch is gone. One is if the, od is the audience in Boulder, it's supposed to have the highest IQ in the U right. US <laughs> right. or things. Yeah. Just the, the local audience is different from the typical uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. audience, which mm -hmm. you would be able to also answer because of all the festivals you do there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. whether the fact that you have the Naropa University and things mm -hmm. makes uh, something from India, you know, these two. What, what is actually interesting is that, you know, Boulder has uh, two universities, the University of Boulder, there. Colorado and Naropa. And in the earlier mm -hmm. years, we had very good relationships with both. But the city was very clear that if we cross the road, it's literally where you, know, where you all are. This is where we are, which is the city. That's where you all are, which is the University of Boulder, Colorado. But if we did got, cross the road, the city would not be able to support it. It would be right. seen as the university. And we do not get people from the university crossing the road to this mm -hmm. side either. So despite our relationship with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Naropa, and despite our annual conversations with the University right. of Boulder, uh, we still haven't yeah. got the department heads in the University of Boulder, uh, Colorado, mm -hmm. to actually speak to each other, let alone the students. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called in Boulder, Colorado, which is a very small town, 100,000 people, including 20,000 students. It's called the town-gown divide. And and the university cannot fund anything outside of the university. They can't support anything that's not a university-sponsored, driven, produced event. Um, I think a lot of, even getting into schools in Boulder, Colorado is next to impossible. I have a partnership with the language arts director for Boulder Valley School District um, with, uh, uh, oh, uh, but it, 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 they can't make it happen in the schools. The principal of a school can't make it happen in the schools. It's each individual teacher, just like you have to communicate with each individual professor on campus, which I've done 10 years of writing to 500 professors who one still will come down the hill and tell me, you should have told me about this. And I'm thinking, you've gotten you know, 170 emails from me, so I'm not really... You know. But in yeah. recent years, not in recent years, year on year, yeah. you know, 
Uh, more and more people have flown in to Boulder yes. from across yeah. the United States uh, to be part of the festival. It's still a small amount, maybe six or seven percent of the yeah. 14, yeah. 15,000 people who come through yeah. our doors over the two and a half days. You yeah. wanted to ask yeah. a question. Well, I wanted to ask, do you also get some support from foreign cultural institutions? Foreign cultural? From the uh, National uh, Endowment uh, of the uh, Arts, yes. Yeah. Right. The Canadians. Yes. We're going for it, yeah. We, 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 what's work? Yeah. I'd like, it, what's hard for us in the United States is to understand which council, department, institute to go to. It's like opening the encyclopedia, more or less, to know who would fund that kind of thing. However, we have got in Canada. We have a number of consulates in Denver. But they're kind of branch consulates, so it's not like the main consulate is in Houston or San Francisco or something like that. And I, but we're uh, contacting all the consulates. We might be able to do something with Mexico. But we would love more of that particular contact because we understand people would love to bring their writers to the United States. One of the problems, Claudia, is that a lot of people in the United States don't know where Boulder is. They know where Colorado is, but <laughs> they know where Denver is. So they certainly don't know where... So, you know, and they're yeah. all very perplexed. Yeah. Uh, and many of them come for the first time yeah. to Boulder, yeah. and it's a beautiful walking city, which is the Gorgeous. reason we continue yeah. to be there. Yeah. You know, the foothills of, yeah. of, of the Rocky Mountains, yeah. it's stunning. But Thank as, you. Yeah, as Namita was saying, I don't want to just draw this <coughs> pain, picture of pain because it's, it's an exquisite festival, and it's profound, and uh, we just have to understand how to get the message out. Yeah. <laughs> Akitsu Pelmo Wangdi is the festival producer of the Bhutan Echoes Festival. Namita, for many years, used to be its director. I think she came back from the United States, Hampshire, uh, uh, and uh, took over this particular thing. Kitsu, tell us some of the challenges and, and what made you take on this role and what made you return from Hampshire, uh, which is a different world. Thank you. I just Hampshire itself is a, a whole n nation by its nation state by itself, which ceded from Trump some time ago. Um, I just wanted to express my um, gratitude uh, to Namita. Oh, was it close. really close? Okay. No, I just wanted to express my um, heartfelt gratitude to uh, Namita Gokhale and louder, <laughs> Sanjay. No, 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 I, I think it is loud. Hold it. hold it like this, and if you hold it like this, and that's. So yeah. Right. yeah, and closer to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, to all the organizing team for your warm hospitality and for having me here. It is uh, such an honor to be on this um, uh, panel with all these esteemed festival directors. And thank you for the correction. I am uh, the producer, and I'm usually, this is very rare because I'm usually behind the stage. Um, so this is rare to be on stage and speaking. Um, so maybe I could, uh, maybe I, I'll start with Bhutan Echoes. Um, so Bhutan Echoes uh, is a arts and initiative, literature and arts initiative um, under Her Majesty the Queen Mother, Gyalyum Ajidoji Wangma Wangchuk. It started as an Indo-Bhutan initiative in uh, 2010, and the, cello, the festival and also the cultural exchange was uh, made possible by the uh, Indian ambassador at the time, uh, Pravan K. Varma, uh, Namita Gokhale, Mita Kapoor, Pramod K. G., and um, others. Uh, and so after, uh, we've had a decade of um, <coughs> rich cultural engagements um, and had the privilege of um, inviting, uh, welcoming literary figures like Pico Ayer, Ruskin Bond, and Marcus Susak. Uh, and then in, in 2020, to promote more local engagement, we started a new chapter uh, and we transitioned from uh, Mountain Echoes to Bhutan Echoes. And uh, His Majesty the King also uh, renamed the festival as Drukyul Zuruja Festival, and Drukyul uh, means Bhutan. Um, so since in 2020, because of COVID, it was on halt for two years. And since then, um, we, uh, 2021 is when I first joined the festival as a producer. And uh, my entire team got COVID. And so we had to 
um, cancel and then uh, we had about 10 days to turn it into a virtual festival. Um, but we also learned the convenience that it brought together in terms of making it very accessible for not just um, uh, the attendees and readers in Bhutan, but also making it accessible to the outside world to be uh, to watch the festival online. And last year was very special as it marked a very uh, significant um, a reunion as we uh, was it was a reunion uh, that we opened um, after four challenging years uh, and also the festival theme was reconnecting and reviving which really captured the core efforts of our uh, efforts to um, bridge connections between people and rekindling the essence of literature and arts um, and uh, we're quite excited because now uh, the festival is upcoming this year's festival is will take place in august August uh, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, so please do save the date, and if you're interested to visit, uh, highly encourage. Um, what are some of the challenges, uh, Kitsu, doing this? And where, tell us a little bit about the setting, and where is the festival located, and who comes to it? Uh, well, we're very lucky, because um, when I joined, I didn't really, the template, uh, because of um, the previous co-founders had already create, paved the path for us and created a template that I simply had to follow. Uh, but we also faced our own set of challenges. The venue is at the Royal University of Bhutan, uh, which is this beautiful fort, um, uh, wooden architect um, in the middle of, uh, in Thimpu, it takes place in the capital. And it can hold about 300 uh, people in the auditorium. But uh, last year was quite exciting because we had about, in comparison to JLF, we had about um, 500 footfall in the day. So that's quite a lot for us. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your questions, though. Yeah, and, challenges. And oh, so one of the challenges is that it's, I think, um, the general belief is that a lot of uh, books have declined, publishers and books have declined over the years, but it's been quite the opposite in Bhutan because post-COVID, we've had so many young Bhutanese writers have, that have written books, but the issue with these books are that it's not really ready uh, for the market um, because we don't really have publishing houses in Bhutan. Everyone is an independent publisher. Um, so I think there's that lack of understanding of the uh, publishing process and uh, editing process, how that works. Uh, we're also relatively new to this, and uh, this is where I think there's like a big need where whether we could provide workshops during the festival, invite mentors and um, uh, editors from Penguin and Harper and other uh, publishing houses to uh, provide that kind of resources to our Bhutanese uh, upcoming writers. And, uh, and how artists. do books get distributed? Is there a book buying culture now? We do, uh, we have only about, I think, four to five bookshops in the capital, uh, but they do their best in terms of supplying books. Um, but because also our reading community and the literary community is very small, uh, so it's been, um, but last year we faced a challenge in uh, bringing, uh, supplying the books to the festival. I actually had to manually order the books on Amazon to, to have it out because we didn't have any connections to the publishing houses yet. Uh, so it's, a conti it's been a continuous um, learning journey. <laughs> And tell us a little bit about some of your rules and regulations. Is there censorship? Is it open? Can you talk about everything? You're a fairly newly minted democracy uh, in Bhutan, but also very open. The whole new education policy yes. uh, that you all are rolling out. Um, th so the festival is supported by the government of India and Bhutan. It's called Indo-Bhutan Initiative. Um, so we try to uh, stay uh, uh, take a neutral uh, political stance in terms of the uh, themes and topics and books and authors that we. How do you manage in. China and everything thereof? I don't think I'm in the position to <laughs> or the right person to be. Well, China is not such a literary society. I think India is the society. Yeah. 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 No, but not that is maybe accessing in Chinese, but I don't think it is that accessible for the audiences in Bhutan. And, and what's the language that they access books in? Is it primarily only in English, or is there more and more Bhutanese uh, imprints now coming out? So the primary language that's taught um, in schools is English, so that's why everyone's very fluent with English, and a lot of writers also are writing books in, in English. Uh, but something I, you know, it's, it's been a learning, uh, what is it, eye-opening and tremendous learning opportunity because this is my first time here at JLF, 
And I think uh, uh, something that we also need to learn from JLF uh, is to incorporate more sessions in Zongkha because we don't have enough sessions. Um, but with the, the challenges that we face in bringing um, or featuring Bhutanese authors or authors who've written uh, in Zongkha is that most of these books, profound books that are written by them, they're not very comfortable sharing their stories on stage. Uh, so it's also learning to uh, maintain the authenticity of these narratives as well as the being considerate and respectful of their uh, comfort levels of the storytellers. Thank you. Sorry, if you could mention yeah. uh, that we were fortunate to have her majesty, Marshi Dorji, Mango Wang, to the Queen Mother and Boulder. Boulder and, of course, in, in JLF as well. But go ahead, call Claudia, you were asking a question. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So the policies have been. Thank you for the question. Um, accessibility is also a, one of the biggest challenges that we've been facing as because a festival. Because there's no airport in Thimphu. You land in Paro, which is one about hour. 100? It's an, an yeah. hour ride. Uh, so. hour. Um, uh, but it is the policies with the uh, with the tourism has constantly been changing. Um, but at least with our speakers, since we have the goodwill of the government, so our speakers. Um, uh, the STF, the Sustainable Development Fee, uh, which is I think applies 1,200 to regional sp regional uh, tourists, and then for international, it used to be 200, but now it's uh, brought down back to 100 dollars per day. Um, that's waved off, and so at least it's easier. But in terms of trying to really promote the festival to outsiders to attend, I think that's been um, a, a challenge. So yes, there is the fee, Sustainable Development Fee of. Um, uh, of hundred dollars per day, uh, but I think they're still working on it to make uh, to making it uh, what is it um, accessible and uh, feasible. Uh. Claudia, one of the reasons why they do this is that they didn't want Bhutan to be swamped with backpacker tourists yeah. and everything that that means. Pretty much like what Amsterdam is struggling with right now and wants to change. So you know, it was a pretty interesting concept when they started. Namita, you no, were saying. Anybody who registered the festival also get the waiver or only the speakers? Uh, it only applies to the speakers, La. Any other questions for Bhutan? Brian, Brian, tell us a little bit about uh, Dare to Overcome and uh, your organization. And you've done a number, not just the United States. You did a, an edition in, in the UAE. Uh, was it the UAE or was it Qatar? UAE. Yeah, which UAE. is before you came to India. So tell us a little bit about what the ambition is, how do you go about it, and what's the dream? Yeah, so I'm a little bit different. We, we're not a literature literary festival, but we're a business festival. So we're um, trying to... A business to festival, but they have talks across the spectrum on gender, on equality, on business, and forums. Yeah, and so the, the challenge... HR. Yeah, the challenge is, in a polarized world... Um, what can business do? So business has such a big voice to change culture. So we work largely on <clears throat> sort of religious freedom, broadly defined, how to bring, uh, let everybody have a faith, change their faith, have no faith at all, and, uh, and then live accordingly, by, according to their conscience. Uh, but that's under threat everywhere, from religious nationalism and all kinds of other challenges. Um, so how can we change the narrative? And that's what we're trying to do by bringing business into the discussion where, uh, and be, by beginning by getting businesses to make their own workplaces um, faith friendly, so to speak. And, and doing that with the, the large uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, initiatives around the world, uh, many businesses include you know, gender, sexual orientation, race, abilities, different, you know, there's standard categories, uh, but we don't talk about religion. Um, so what I've found is that businesses started losing employees um, around the world if they didn't make them feel like they belonged, if they, people of faith. Uh, so big tech company in California uh, said, we don't know religion. And a Muslim guy wanted to pray, just block an hour on his calendar for prayer on Friday. And they said, you can't do that. You can't block your calendar for prayer. But across the street at Salesforce, another big company, they 
let them block their calendar for prayer and they were accommodating and long story short he went over there and the other company now has changed their whole policy so once sort of changed sorry one second branch uh, sam or kartika any of you here <coughs> sorry can you just give them my phone and tell them that uh, the gajanan the cm uh, has been calling non stop if they can please take the call and Sorry, Brian. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, how do we get first businesses to change their culture? And then how does that change the larger discussion? And, and really, the, we bring people together at the festival who talk about what they're doing inside companies. Uh, we'll have a festival March 4th in London at Salesforce Tower, and we give awards to businesses that are making these changes. And one of the top companies uh, off the record, if we're not broadcasting, is Rolls-Royce. They're, they're literally the Rolls-Royce of uh, religious inclusion. And so we've had meetings at 10 Downing Street and so in British Parliament. So I think, you know, as you think about, you know, literature is all about changing hearts and minds, really. And, and so bringing businesses into that discussion. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but all of you know business is what makes everything run. And so that's the part of the world I'm trying to bring in. And, and how, do, how, do, how does it pay for itself? And what's the kind of people who come to it? And you know, talk a little bit about the India chapter uh, yeah. that you set up last year. Yeah, so with Team What's Guards, then we had an um, India chapter in October, last October. And we had multinational companies coming. So we had the vice presidents from half a dozen um, multinationals come and speak. But then big uh, Indian companies like Godridge Industries, the CEO Nadir, Nadir Godridge came, uh, the JSW groups, uh, Sangeeta Jindal came. Um, so, you know, though, so for many of the Indian companies, they realize if India is going to succeed, it has everything going for it uh, as long as everything keeps going together and doesn't split. And so I think for the businesses, that's their motivation. And it's the same everywhere. You know, it's not, not just India, that where there's peace, there's prosperity. And where there's not, you know, it, it's only good for bullet and bomb makers to the economy. So I think those are, you know, those are the kind of voices that we're trying to lift up. Um, and these awards we give, uh, already Dell Technologies CEO uh, Michael Bloomberg has been nominated for the work he's doing, whether he'll be able to come to our next edition in India, but it's on his calendar. So we're hoping for those kind of people. And, and it's also for, um, I think the, the interesting thing about our, our session, it's like JLF. We had CEOs and we had people that are just working in companies and we had people from the BJP and we had people from Congress and we had people, I mean, it was like it, this, this, this is something that brought people together. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, this initiative can, can not just be for the left elite, um, but also for the, the, whatever the right is in a particular place. You were asking a question, yeah, Deepak. So in the UAE, we work with um, Sheikh Mo, uh, Bin Baya. I don't know if you know him, but he has a forum for, uh, uh, inter I think it's Interfaith Understanding and Peace. And it's, it came out of the Marrakesh Declaration where the, the Muslims came and, and looked back at uh, the Medina Declaration at the time of Muhammad and said that citizenship is for everyone, not just for Muslims. So coming out of that then, there's been a large discussion about how religion should be inclusive and open to everyone. Um, so working with that, those, those groups. And then the other part in the UAE for a number of, so I also work with the World Economic Forum, the Davos folks, and I was the chair of the Global Council on the Role of Faith. And the UAE would host discussions on that. So it's it sort of, Sort of the business angle um, is one, and then the other is the peace angle. And then, then if you're talking about peace or business, it seems like then religion, you, you can bring that, that in. And even politics, 
as long because we focus on what's working, not on criticisms. So that's also part of the secret. You and know. because it's pretty much business driven, it's not seen to be a, a literature or a, or a forum for that. It's uh, it's keep keep it simple. It seemed to be a business forum, yeah. and I think that's the difference. That under the guise of business, inclusivity is cool, yeah. you know, and that's something that we need to really learn in terms of how to negotiate uh, around this. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's well. Yeah, it's it's uh, who was saying it? it's how you say it. You have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's yeah. and and so we didn't in our India chapter we didn't talk about religion. We talked about culture, but what is culture in India? So, you know, using words that don't raise red flags. Thank you. The Mysuru Festival. Um, Ajmer. Sorry, Ajmer Festival. Uh, you started that fairly recently. How uh, many years have you been doing it? We are doing it in 2014. Tell us a little bit about the challenge. I remember that you called me and said that you are in it. That come together, let's work. Yeah, Ajmer is very close to Jaipur. It's sort of an hour and a half, two hour drive from here. It's a very old uh, city. Uh, it's written up in every book. It's the, it's the seat of uh, the Sufi tradition uh, with a very famous uh, establishment there. Just like you said, Hindi me bolunga, apne comfortable. Hum Ajmer se yahan Jaipur literature festivals dekhne aaya karte the. कुछ फ्रेंड्स के साथ बहुत सालों से आ रहे थे। तो इस तो कम वेरी रेगुलरली फ्रॉम अजमेर टू सी द जयपुर लड़चा फेस्टिवल। रेगुलरली। नंबर ऑफ पर्सन्स आल्सो अटेंडिंग द फेस्टिवल, द सेम फेस्टिवल, एंड दे हैव ओन एम्बिशंस कि वी हैव ऑर्गेनाइज्ड सच ए फेस्टिवल इन अजमेर आल्सो। एनीवे, दे आस्क्ड मी कि यू मस्ट हैव � Anyway, we, five or six friends, collect uh, um, the imagination and start. Chaliye. Chaliye, chaliye. I'm comfortable in Russia. Okay? So, we tried to start to do it. And the first challenge I was there, I was starting to start 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 उसमें भी बहुत कुछ लगता है। मेरे एक दो दोस्त थे जो पॉलिटिकल विंग में थे, पावरफुल थे उस वक्त की पॉलिटिक्स में। 2014 में पावर्स का थोड़ा सा शिफ्टिंग हो रहा था। तो उस पावर विंग में थे, तो मैंने उनसे सबसे पहले कहा, तो मैंने कहा ऐसे-ऐसे वैसे यार आपको मेरी हेल्प करनी है, वो मेरी हेल्प के a few of them got together, they envisioned that they wanted to do a festival like this. And then in 2014, there was a change of the political guard and... Yeah. So, they said to me, first of all, you do this, do humor, do comedy, do anything. We will also do support you, we will also give you help, we will also arrange funds. But don't do a literature festival. Meaning, do anything, do stand-up comedy, do whatever you want, but do not do a literature festival. We'll find you funding for anything you want to do, but not a literature festival. Because we get frightened of the very word literature. So examples कि इस तरह का वहाँ पर कंट्रोवर्सी हो गई, वहाँ पर ये हो गया, वो हो गया। अजमेर में अजमेर पीसफुल जगह है, यहाँ हम कोई कंट्रोवर्सी। They talked about the controversy is obviously referring to the Jaipur Literature Festival, which always gets into some trouble, and which is very much part of the idiom of the larger Rajasthan and Indian collective. Anyway, तो then फिर भी मैंने कहा मैं let me start, और मैंने वहाँ वो एक जगह वेन्यू बुक कराया है, जिसमें गवर्नमेंट का थोड़ा इं so they said, how can you do? They were threatening. They were threatening. They were talking about the first time. After that, they were talking about the place to cancel. So basically, they found a place, but rather than saying that, you know, they started threatening him that, if you go ahead, we won't give you permission to use this place. Anyway, then I had a friend in private, who had a very big hotel. They allowed me to do a festival there. 
और दे बिगैन इट इन होटल विच वॉज अट प्राइवेट प्लेस और उस फेस्टिवल में पहली बार में ठीक ठाक सा लोगों ने उसको अप्रिशिएट किया अशोक वाजपेयी पुरुषोत्तम अग्रवाल सभी मतलब ठीक ठाक लोग आ गए थे तीन दिन का हमने फेस्टिवल किया लगभग लगभग पहली बार में हमने सत्रह सेशन किए थे तो इन द फर्स्ट ईयर दे डिड सेवेंटीन सेशन दे हैड सम ऑफ द ग्रेट ल्यूमिनरीज अक्रॉस द स्पेक्ट्रम कमिंग एंड स्पीकिंग और हम, हमें सपोर्ट मीडिया का और सोसाइटी का और फाइनेंस का भी लोग जो से हमने कुछ कहा जो भी कह सकते हैं लोकल छोटी जगह पर फायदा ये होता है कि आपको लोग जानते होते हैं पर्सनल वो इन इन अ स्मॉल प्लेस इट्स मच इजियर बिकॉज पीपल नो यू सो यू कैन रेज मनी एंड रिसोर्स ऑन दिस वन टू वन सेंग दैट है वी नो इच अदर सो दे फॉर दिस इज वॉट आई एम डूइंग सो हेल्प मी कुछ एकेडमिक इंस्टीट्यूशन जैसे मेयो कॉलेज एक्सेट्रा जो अजमेर में हैं उन्होंने भी हमको सपोर्ट किया इंक्लूडिंग एकेडमिक इंस्टीट्यूशन लाइक मेयो कॉलेज विच इज़ अ वेरी एमिनेंट स्कूल उसके बाद हम स्टार्ट हो गए उसके बाद हमें थोड़ी दिक्कत नहीं आई लेकिन दो इवेंट दो जगह ऐसा हुआ 2015 या 16 की 16 की बात है आई थिंक अब्बास ताबिश पाकिस्तान के एक शायर हैं तो हमने उनको इन्वाइट किया था तो दिस इज़ इन 2015-16 दे इन्वाइटेड अ पर्टिकुलर पोइट फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान एंड जस्ट फॉर द रेफरेंस आई मीन पाकिस्तान इज सीन टू बी द बैड इज फॉर आर गवर्नमेंट हियर और इवनिंग में हमको जो वहाँ की लोकल पॉलिटिक्स थी उनके बहुत एमिनेंट लोगों ने उसको कैंसिल करने के लिए प्रेशर डाला और हम उनका शो नहीं कर पाए मतलब सो द पोलिटिशियंस इन अजमेर एंड पुट अ लॉट ऑफ प्रेशर ऑन हिम टू कैंसिल दियरेंस ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर पोइट और मैं दे कुडन डू दैट दे हैड टू कैंसिल द शो बहुत शर्मिंदा महसूस किया मैंने नेचुरली कि कोई मैं बुला करके मैं उनको वन स्टेटमेंट जो उन्होंने दिया बहुत अच्छा था अब्बास ताबिश ने मुझे कहा था कि बधाई हो अब आप भी हमारे जैसे हो गए हो बेसिकली बेसिकली वॉट द पोइट सेट टू हिम इज दैट बाई डूइंग दिस बिकॉज वॉज अलॉट ऑफ फ्लैक्ट दे गॉट इज सेट ओके सो नाउ यू बिकम लाइक मी The other and उसके बाद उन्नीस में दो हज़ार उन्नीस में नसरुद्दीन शाह आए थे उनके एक बुक लॉन्च होनी थी अजमेर में नसरुद्दीन शाह इज अ बिग एक्टर नोन फॉर इज वेरी क्लियर पोलिटिकल व्यूज पुश बैक अगेंस्ट दिस प्रेजेंट नैरेटिव ऑल्सो पार्ट ऑफ अ माइनॉरिटी कम्युनिटी दो दिन पहले उन्होंने किसी प्राइवेट वेबसाइट को कोई इंटरव्यू दिया था उसमें उन्होंने ये कहा था Uh, बहुत सॉफ्ट uh, सी बात कही थी कि मैं मुस्लिम हूँ और मेरी वाइफ हिंदू है मेरे बच्चे किस रिलीजन में होंगे मुझे नहीं पता मीनिंग आई एम मुस्लिम बट माई वाइफ इज हिंदू सो आई डोंट नो वॉट रिलीजन माई चिल्ड्रन आर पार्ट ऑफ और इसको कंट्रोवर्सी बनाकर बहुत uh, एक हाइप क्रिएट किया गया था फॉर्चुनेटली और अनफॉर्चुनेटली हमने एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन uh, को भी कह दिया था कांग्रेस की गवर्नमेंट आ चुकी थी राजस्थान में दो हज़ार उन्नीस सो बाई विच टाइम द कांग्रेस आई मीन इन द टाइम दैट ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट विद द पाकिस्तान इंसिडेंट इट वॉज द प्रेजेंट गवर्नमेंट विच वॉज द बी जे पी बट बाई बाई विच टाइम वेन नासिरुद्दीन शाह केम इट वॉज द कांग्रेस गवर्नमेंट विच इज सीन सपोजिटली टू बी मोर लिबरल बट जस्ट फॉर द रिकॉर्ड वी गेट मोर ट्रबल फ्रॉम दैम दैन दी अदर साइड फर्स्ट सेशन नसरुद्दीन शाह का था उनको इनोग्रेट करना था तो जो उनके लोग थे उन्होंने हमारे स्टेज पर चढ़ कर के बैनर्स वगैरह फाड़ दिए स्टेज डैमेज कर दिया और दैट वाज और कुछ हमारे डेलीगेट्स थे उनको भी हर्ट किया बहुत दे बेसिकली अटैक द स्टेज एंड टोर अप एवरी थिंग एंड बीट अप पीपल बीट अप द स्पीकर्स जब तक नसरुद्दीन शाह होटल में ही थे मतलब फिर हमने नसरुद्दीन शाह को स्टेज तक नहीं ला पाए हम और उनको कहा ठीक है हम ये सेशन कैंसिल कर रहे हैं इसके बाद ये हमने कैंसिल हो सेशन तो कर दिया जो हमें कम्युनिकेशन करना था लेकिन हमने एक चालाकी की अच्छा किया उनको दूसरी तरह से ने जयपुर शिफ्ट कर दिया नजरुद्दीन शाह को और एक दूसरे प्राइवेट होटल में वो सेशन किया और उस सेशन को हमने कंप्लीट किया बेसिकली दे दे कैंसिल द सेशन इन इन अजमेर इन द फेस्टिवल बट वेड इज देन शिफ्टेड इट टू जयपुर एन दे डिड इट इन अ प्राइवेट स्पेस इन अटल हि उस समय के चीफ मिनिस्टर अशोक गहलोत ने ट्वीट किया था उस शाम को कि ऑर्गेनाइजर को डरना नहीं चाहिए था गवर्नमेंट उनकी हेल्प करती 
और लेकिन मैंने उनको ट्वीट किया था गवर्नमेंट ने हेल्प नहीं की हमने ये फेस्टिवल कर दिया और उसका वीडियो मैंने उनको भेज दिया था सो दैट इवनिंग देन चीफ मिनिस्टर Uh, the organization organizers shouldn't worry and that the government would help but he then tweeted back saying that the government did not help but we went ahead and did this and he added the image of the session to it to is tarah ke 2019 ke 20 ke baad corona aa gaya hum uske baad nahi kar paye iske alawa jo humne hamare festival ki jo theme rehti thi wo basically hindi mein hota tha kyunki hum hindi ki delegates aur 2019 में हमने पूरा फेस्टिवल गांधी को डेडिकेटेड किया था सारे सेशन नसरुद्दीन शाह के अलावा गांधी पर थे सो इन 2019 मोस्ट ऑफ द फेस्टिवल वाज बेस्ड अराउंड द थीम ऑफ गांधी ये हम और अब क्या है कि अब तो आप देख ही रहे हो कि मैं तो यहां भी तो देख रहा हूं अब तो बहुत मुश्किल हो गया है क्योंकि पावर और सोसाइटी दोनों ही हमें मतलब बहुत कंफर्टेबल जोन में नहीं है आखिरी चीज जो मैं जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल और आप लोगों से चाहता हूं या कहना चाहता हूं अजमेर जैसे छोटे छोटे शहर में एक बहुत बड़ा वर्ग है जो लिटरेचर सुनना चाहता है जानना चाहता है जु, जुड़ना भी चाहता है उसका कोई दोष भी नहीं है तो अगर हम ऐसी कोई बड़ी अम्ब्रेला हमारे छो, छोटे शहरों के ऑर्गेनाइजर को दे सकें कि क्योंकि क्या होता है कि बड़ी आवाज़ बड़ी होती है छोटे शहरों में बहुत से लोग उगने से पहले ख़त्म हो जाते हैं तो हमें या हमें अजमेर जैसे ऑर्गेनाइज़र को अजमेर फेस्टिवल जैसे जगह पर फेस्टिवल को पहुँचाने के लिए एक बड़ी कलेक्टिव अम्ब्रेला हमें बनानी चाहिए जो भी क्योंकि अब देश में स्थितियाँ बहुत ज़्यादा अनुकूल हो पाएंगी ऐसा मुझे लगता नहीं सो ही सेंग दैट बिकॉज द सिचुएशन इन द कंट्री इज सो डिफिकल्ट बिकॉज ऑफ दी ऑफ द वे द नैरेटिव इज गोइंग इफ लार्जर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन लाइक द जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल कैन एक्सटेंड एन अम्ब्रेला ओवर स्मॉलर फेस्टिवल्स लाइक द अजमेर फेस्टिवल टू बी एबल टू सपोर्ट दैम एंड सी हाउ वी कैन सेंड राइटर्स एंड एंड स्पीकर्स दे मेरे ख्याल से चैलेंजेस यही थे बाकी तो सब हम मैनेज कर ही लेते हैं छोटे शहरों के लोग थैंक यू थैंक यू गॉर्जी शाइनी हैज बीन रशिंग अराउंड फॉर द लास्ट फ्यू डेज इंक्लूडिंग टू दिस पर्टिकुलर सेशन शी इज जस्ट फ्रेश ऑफ द बोट फ्रॉम हर फेस्टिवल व्हिच इज द बैंगलो लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल हाउ मेनी इयर्स शाइनी हैज इट नाउ बीन दिस इज द दिस व्हाट यू हैव जस्ट फिनिश्ड इज द 12th Uh, edition i yet i still have to go to visit it but i keep promising it sanjoy just keeps ditching us yeah the shiny tell us a little bit about you've had your own you've had your own controversies you've had churnings within your organizations uh the festival itself has grown uh, over the years tell us a little bit about the festival and of course the challenge so yeah it's been 12 years bangalore literature festival and the biggest thing that people talk about it is a funding model it's a community funded festival it's a citizen funded festival and uh, yeah it's been 12 years we've had our challenges mainly like everybody else money money has been a challenge uh, though we have very passionate uh, donors private individuals who look to literature and they donate but yeah tell us a little bit more about the festival how many days where does it happen yeah, yeah. so it's a two day festival uh, it's over a weekend in december and um, where where and uh, we've been changing the venue so it's been mainly in the lawns of hotels so right now we are in ashoka ashoka you mean lalit and namita yeah sorry lalit, lalit so yeah. namita and sanjoy have not come for the festival yet we will we i've been inviting them <laughs> we we promise to amen shani tell us a little bit about organization because you know you all unlike us we are an organization and namita and william are associated with it uh, you know we have lots of people blah 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 tell us a little bit about how you you all organize it because that again is a different model especially in the way that is funded and of course in the way that you all run it yeah because we none of us are paid everybody is uh, just a volunteer um what, what did you say how do we how did how do you organize it Being see i really feel this blf is beyond us beyond the organizers the people will lynch us if we stop so the two things that work in our advantage is the average bangalorean who comes there well read ready to engage with the writers telling us which writers to call all year round if i go anywhere people just come to me and say 
why don't you call so and so why don't you call so and so so we have this uh, whatsapp group in which we just put authors and if somebody's loved the book we just put it there if we read a review we put it there so we don't i feel we don't go the normal way about inviting authors we go with uh, we go by verbal recommendations by people within bangalore because this is a festival by bangaloreans for bangaloreans so we go by what people who people recommend like they say we really love this book even if that author hasn't come out with that book like right then that does not matter to us then we are able to call that person the second thing that works for us and i don't have the statistics but people say that bangalore is the book capital of india that the largest number of books are bought or sold in bangalore so these two things have really nothing to do with the organizers these this goes beyond the organizing team and frankly the curator the uh, organizing team the volunteers everybody is replaceable and that's because it truly is a festival of the readers i'm, I'm going to open it up for questions we have a few minutes left sorry 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 go ahead please sorry in in my in my in my whole thing of what but go ahead please yeah shubha sanjay urs from the no, that's not urs that's urs so it's spelled as u but it's uh, you know and uh, namita the mysuru festival i run the mysuru literature festival and congratulations to namita and sanjay for not letting that smile fade away from your faces with all the things that's going haywire and everything and warm welcome to the whole directors team to the mysuru for the first conference if we are ever going to have it <laughs> okay so this is a small town where you all will be looked after beautifully it's a beautiful S town yeah and it's almost like jaipur with lots of palaces and the hill and the dam and things like that which is you'll have lots of things to do and there and dancing fountains in a garden garden <laughs> Oh okay <laughs> okay so unlike all of you i started with the first book club in mysore in 2010 because i wanted to do something for the society and i started frequenting mysore which is my hometown so one book club and another and another and now i have 29 book club at book clubs and i run book clubs for the orphanages slums differently abled schools and for all these construction workers children and all the government schools and things like that other than this other than this i have children book club for children you can see my son sitting there he is about 9 years old so i have children book club and i have senior citizens book club young adults book club so the book club go on and on and uh, every month we read a book and every month we discuss for children i have a different pattern so for everyone so i move genres i move the continent and every month i decide on the book and i put it on the group everyone reads comes so i also have now listen and read book club so you know there are people who are finding it a challenge to read so for them i have book clubs where you know i invite the author or a speaker they come and listen and then if they want to they can pick up a book so i have all kinds of varied either and then as i was running these book clubs and then you know i have few book clubs in coimbatore also and then i said why not move to the next step that is the literature festival so the minute in 2017 i decided to start with the first literature festival and then there is this one author called arun raman i was talking to him he said shubha it takes something to think you have thought and you have you're talking to me i think you should do do it and uh, my grand uncle who's been a writer and who's been well known in karnataka i have been with him to many many uh, literature festivals as he was one of the main i mean he was the person who was opening chief guest whatever so in 2017 when i started talking to people saying that i'm going to start the literature festival in my so the first question was literature festival what's that literature festival why here anyway it's happening in delhi and b bigger cities so i said uh, why not so one thing which i didn't have to depend on the mysore uh, people who was having negative 
comments on the literature festival was the audience. Because I had the ready audience from my own book clubs and things like that. And there were a lot of things, because we had already finished reading most of the authors and things like that. Then Girish Karnad was alive, and then I spoke to him. I called him. I said, I'm planning to do this. Will you come and open? And he opened the fest for me. He was already on oxygen. He said, see, I'm already declining, and I don't think it would be a good advice for me to travel. I said, OK, you think about it. And uh, one hour later, he called me back, and he said, you get this, 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 this ready. An ambulance, and the oxygen, and the everything. I said, no, don't worry. All that will be ready. And he, I planned the whole thing. So I curate the festival, and I direct, and I collect the money. So he told me, with, with this, do these things also. That year was MK Indira, author MK Indira's 100th year. So he put the program for me, and he made me get on the stage to read out a passage from MK Indira, which I don't think I would have done it, because I'm a very much backstage person. So for curating, I do it. And then for moderating on all our panels, I have enough for women in, on, on, in my own team, so book club members who double up. So moderators, I really don't reach out to. It's only very rarely I need people from outside when it becomes a very challenging subject and things like that. And yes, I've had some of these uh, drop, I mean, I won't say the challenges. When there was, I was talking to somebody in Bangalore, he said, you know, Shubha, you're doing the Lit Fest for the sixth, this was last, uh, in the seventh year. He said, in seventh year, and then we were planning to do, and then I had this particular uh, author, and he got a call from somebody saying that, how can you call this author? I said, tell me the author and calling him to my son. And I did call him. I did f f face some challenges. But then I kept smiling as I see Namita and uh, Sanjay, and I've seen Shiny also. So I just kept smiling, and I kept hoping inside that you know no untoward incident happens. But in my so yes, every time I go to the press, they do ask me, why don't you give equal importance to Kannada. What it is is they have never come to my literature festival and seen because I have two sessions running parallelly. One is dedicated to Kannada, one is dedicated to English. So if somebody is asking me a question, that means to say they have never come to my literature festival. So I e treat e the Kannada authors and the English authors or any other authors who's coming <coughs> equally. So there is no such question. But I've had people from all these Kannada Sanghas and uh, groups coming over to the Lit Fest and uh, trying to you know, do the create problem. So I have been smiling at them, take them inside. And you know everybody knows. Anything that goes wrong, they have to just reach out to me, and I'm just phone call away. And uh, I go to them smilingly, take them to the Kannada session, show them what's happening there, how Kannada is given importance. So like this, there's been many challenges, but I keep smiling. And now, because I'm running out of space, I've separated out the Children Literature Festival. We run into huge numbers, and the schools, they reach out. Give us a sense of where the festival is located, numbers and the number of days that each of these festivals. Yeah, do. chill. I mean, the literature festival is for two days. And then it is uh, located in, I mean, it happens in the center of the city at a five-star hotel. It's called Hotel Southern Star. It's not as huge as this place. So because of that, now I have to cut down on the Children Literature Festival. So now I run the Children Literature Festival in January. And then the Adults Literature Festival in July. July, so I begin the festival season for the publishers. So in June, they st I start getting the call. Instead of me calling them, they start calling me and saying, which are the authors you want? You're starting the season, so you know. This, 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 this authors are free, and would you want to do this, and things like that. And I have uh, my bookstore uh, partner as uh, Blossoms from Bangalore. He comes and, you know, he has a very good sale. I mean, and then, see, unlike other literature festivals, we buy books throughout the year because, you know, my book club members, they run into almost thousands now. So, you know, we are buying the books through the year. It's not like, you know, literature festival and we sell, we buy the books and it's done with, no. 
and uh, we also buy books and uh, donate to the all these schools and orphanages and slums so when it is the orphanage uh, book club meeting every month what i do is i whoever chooses the story there are many book club members who send it to me i sit with the story sometimes i even give it to my son and uh, you know i remove all the emotional aspects from that story so there's no father there's no mother there's no sisters there's no all those things are removed and all the other things are put into it like you know an ias officer and how they should actually enjoy the environment and they should feel that they are the lucky ones who are actually getting to grow up in an environment like that so all these things so it's a lot of work i'm a textile consultant so i have my own profession but this i do it and all the 29 book club meeting i do it in the first week of the month so the next three weeks is for myself and for my child and then there are lots of challenges which i cannot go deep into all these things but then you know the minute i face the challenge it's like my child my husband so that's how maybe i just kind of cut off and then it's the homework and it's my own work and uh, i also teach uh, silkworm genetics so it's like i start studying for my classes so it goes and shubha who pays for all of this how do you get funding <laughs> it's crowdfunding book club members but mainly my family my friends i can say but mainly the family and they've been strongly behind me hmm. any questions before we i know we're running out of time yeah go ahead i have two questions yeah of uh, uh, jaipur literature festival and how do you get funding and uh, uh, once i get the answer i'll ask the second question okay. <laughs> we'll take both questions and we'll answer we'll answer the second question is after the session is it allowed to take a, a selfie with each one of you <laughs> and the question here hi uh, firstly this is uh, my first uh you know opportunity to attend the jlf and my compliments uh, sincere compliments anjay to you namita and the entire team i think it's an amazing example and a role model of uh, very rich diversity um terrific uh, inclusion uh and yes importantly equity as well and i know that neither of those would have been easy to navigate and i have been hearing from everyone including uh, rather how it's grown uh, beautifully over the years um and uh, we're going to go away as big fans and supporters of the festival um my question is uh, well uh, similar but my broader question to you is how do you see the jlf evolving what's your vision as to how it should look 5 years or so from now so let me ask answer his question first uh, the budget of the festival roughly cash in kind is about 4 million dollars there about 4 million plus a little bit which is fairly substantial because of i think what we forget and i think govind is trying is now figuring out that everybody who comes through the door costs money there's nothing that's free so you know you pick up a program it costs money sit on a chair it costs money you pick up a glass of water it costs money you do back end stuff it costs money you know the ecosystem costs money so there's no free lunch and if it's rain there is additional money. and if there's rain it's additional money uh <laughs> yeah well part of the 4 million how do we raise it um two thirds comes from sponsorship one third comes from additional revenue which is ticketing uh food you know all of the food stall merchandising bookstore uh the delegate registration uh etc so that's one third in an ideal world it should ideally be one third one third one third so one third sponsorship one third ticketing and one third revenue from real estate which is food and booze and so on and so forth so that should be in the ideal world we haven't been able to get there yet uh what's the vision i don't think we you know we didn't start with uh, the festival started by accident and it, it, uh, of course harvard case harvard business school teaches it as a case study where we had a 5 year and a 10 year and a 15 year plan to take over the world and become the largest arts brand uh, you know in the world 
that's not how we started. We do it really organically. And each year, the effort is, can we make a better experience uh, for people, for visitors who come here? Can it become more immersive? Can it be easier to access? Can we make it more inclusive? Can we provide more value? Uh, can we have this breadth of programming, which we really is a breadth of programming with some of the best people, and Amita will talk a little bit about that in a second. Talk about the vision. And the vision in a second. And, and uh, when we started London, JLF London is 10 years old uh, last year. It started both as a, as a thing of self-preservation. We were running, as he said, we were running into a lot of problem with local government and the central government. We wanted a get out of jail free card, so if the festival faced a threat here, we could find another base. We have very good relationships uh, in the UK earlier. Team Buck does a lot of work there. Um, and also because of the pressure of people coming to Jaipur, just continue to increase year on year. You know, 7,000, 14, 30, 60, 120, 240. It literally doubled year on year. So we said, don't come to us, we're coming to you. So that's how, that's how JLF London and then the United States and Australia. So the idea is not how many festivals we'll uh, increase to, but really what are the areas that we need to address? For us, when we go to a Boulder, Colorado, it's also to discover the writing in that neighborhood. Uh, Jovan Mays is this amazing African-American Caribbean writer, a poet, for example. We discovered one block away from the Boulder Public Library, would never, be, no, never performed ever or was invited to the public library. Well, JLF Spain is really about, can we find now a new inroad to an area and countries that we've never been to before, which is the Latin speaking countries. Similarly, even in Africa, you know, we don't have that kind of representation as we've seen. We started a look east policy, trying to get in more uh, part of Namita's list in terms of from the neighborhood, Indonesia, Philippines, Japan, and we hope to grow that. Namita. Uh, I just, when you said, what is your vision? One thought came to me, and I know it is also Sonjoy's vision that in, I don't know which year, the great Indian writer Mahashweta Devi came and spoke here. And in her inaugural speech, she said, the freedom to dream should be the first fundamental right. Yeah. And I think that really is our dream, that all these audiences who come here, the volunteers, they should carry away a sense of possibility from all the different writers and the speakers, because we are often constrained by imaginary circumstances. All of us have so much more to give. And books can help us understand, but not books alone. A book in a distant library is not enough. When you are in a place where people are talking, arguing, so the freedom to dream is our vision. And just to add that, you know, we do get a lot of pressure, uh, obviously, from all over the place. But at some point, neither do we wear our personal politics as such. We believe that this is an equitable space for all kinds of voices. So whether it was in New York where the left was boycotting us, or, 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 or whether last year they said, why are you calling it Mughal tent and you know, blah, blah, blah. We just get on and do what we have to do. And let everybody else shout and scream and so on and so forth. Because we do believe that once you come into this space, and you experience uh, this kind of breadth of understanding and breadth of knowledge and experience. It really is at the cusp of knowledge and the arts and innovation. That's where we sit this festival and try and bring all of the other elements to it. Uh, like anything, like any business, none of this is easy. We've been losing money nine years in a row. Uh, so, you know, uh, nothing is ever easy. But we are committed to that. This is our world, and we will continue to do that. Not just here. We have 33 annual festivals across the world. There's nine JLFs, or 10, nine, whatever, whatever number JLFs that we have across the world. So we'll continue to do that. And, and the challenges don't necessarily only come here. We find in New York or in Houston equally challenging. Well, you know, you, you do something in Doha. When we start first programmed in Doha, our colleagues 
uh, came and said to Namit Hanmi, you can't do three things. You can't have LGBTQ, you can't have Sufi music, and you can't have anything on, uh, on energy, on, 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 you know, on, on the environment. So, we, so Namita said, okay, let's do the opening session as the urgency of borrowed time. And we had Jeffrey Gentleman uh, from the New York Times talk about the environment, but we called it something else. Uh, we had an LGBTQ person in every panel, and we ended with Sufi music. And every evening, uh, every day, the Sheikha, Sheikha Hind, who's the present ruler's uh, this thing, she used to come 45 minutes before <laughs> the festival began every day and just sit quietly. So this last day where we had Kutle Khan, the Sufi, whatever, the library head went hysterical and said, you have to stop. And because I used to receive her every day, I said, you know, Excellency, you know, I, I know that your colleagues are, do you want us to stop? And she said, you know, before we said we would support the festival, we did our homework. And we knew that you always go beyond. If we are not able to debate this and create change within a controlled environment like the library, how will we be able to bring about change? And she said, just continue to do so. Of course, they sacked the library head after that, but that's a different story. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to run, so thank you so much. Please feel free to continue uh, to have conversations. Just thank you so much on behalf of Namita and me to Manisha and Sam and all our colleagues at JBF, Girish, etc. To all our volunteers, to our technical crew, and to each one of you for coming together uh, to JBM, and we'll continue to hopefully grow this conversation, uh, not just here, but in other cities. Thank you so much. <laughs>